Okay, this is uh, Chapter 2, Culture and Human Nature. Uh, I really like cultural psychology. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I've lived uh, around the world uh, in a lot of different cultures, and it's, it's uh, uh, nice to talk about these things. These are things that I've experienced myself, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's nice to be able to uh, talk about uh, different cultures that I've, ex I've experienced. This is a Japanese culture, of course. Last uh, the last uh, PowerPoint was on a Chinese uh, influenced uh, PowerPoint template. Humans are quite particular about whom they choose to imitate. Humans are said to have prestige bias. Uh, they are especially concerned with detecting who has prestige. That is, they seek others who have skills and are respected by others, and they try to imitate what these individuals are doing. So if you, if you observe somebody that uh, you, you, would, you would like to date uh, uh, people, you would like to uh, attract the opposite sex, or the same sex for that matter, um, you would, uh, then you would try to imitate somebody who is successful at uh, attracting those individuals. Uh, so, okay, so let me give you two examples. There you go. That's, <laughs> these are women who dress up like Dolly Parton. <laughs> so they're imitating Dolly Parton. I think they're women. Some of them may be men. Uh, I'm not sure. Anyway, those are Dolly Parton imitators, and these are Elvis imitators. There's two from his early years in the 1950s, and this is more from the late 60s, early 70s. These guys dressed up in their white uh, lame uh, outfits. Two of them have exactly the same outfit on, this guy and this guy. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. I guess they look enough like Elvis that uh, that's a positive uh, uh, imitation. They're Elvis Presley impersonators. Uh, so I hope they sing like Elvis. Uh, there you go. Anyway, um, two Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, two Halloweens ago, <laughs> I always dress up for Halloween. Uh, and uh, in 2019, I dressed up like a, uh, a college man from uh, the 1920s. Uh, and to my surprise, <laughs> Patrick Blackwater dressed up too, but he dressed up like me. <laughs> and I, I, I had a picture of it. Uh, I showed it to, uh, uh, I showed it to some people, and they thought it was funny. Uh, but Patrick dressed up like me. Now he may have been making fun of me, but uh, uh, you know, I'm I'm not real bright, so I'll just pretend that he was uh, imitating me because. Uh, because of uh, my beauty or something, or or my charisma or whatever. Anyway, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pretend that's what it was. Imitating prestigious others is a very efficient way of uh, cultural learning. Uh, individuals are more likely to learn successfully uh, if they target those people who are especially talented. If you know Patrick, you need to ask him about that, okay? Ask him why he dressed up like me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, T tell him that he looked, that's, that's the only time he's ever looked good. <laughs> just, just kidding. Ident identifying signs of prestige and then imitating people who displayed those signs or skills that were likely selected for in the course of human evolution. Our ancestors who did this were more likely to acquire the highly useful cultural knowledge that gave them a survival advantage compared with those who did not. Uh, so the people who uh, imitated uh, hunters uh, were more likely to find food and they were more likely to survive. Uh, if they prayed correctly or stood correctly or acted the right way, uh, then potentially they uh, were lucky on the hunt. Uh, and therefore they were able uh, to uh, secure enough food for their family to survive. Humans have what is known as a theory of mind. A theory of mind means that people understand that others have minds that are different from their own, and thus 
that other people have perspectives and intentions that are different from their own. I know what you're thinking, terrible things about me. Well, screw you and your judgments. And, of course, what he was thinking about was pie. <laughs> Looks like uh, banana cream pie, actually. Imitative learning is where the learner copies precisely what they think the model is trying to do. Emulative uh, learning is where the learner is focused on the environmental events that are involved. The emulative learner is only focused on what on the events that happen around the model, not what the model intends to accomplish. In emulative learning, you learn one task but can't use that knowledge in any other context. Human cultural learning is cumulative. Cultural information grows in complexity and often in utility over time. This is called the ratchet effect. Like a ratchet, it always moves forward and is not allowed to slip backward. Cultural information can continue to accumulate without losing the earlier information. And that's the idea of the ratchet. So if you invent the wheel, you can't uninvent the wheel. Uh, you will always have wheels after that. Uh, and some cultures didn't have wheels. I don't think there were wheels in the Americas. Not that I'm aware of before Europeans got here. Um, there are a lot of foods that were here that uh, weren't over in Europe or Africa or Asia. Uh, foods that have become the staples, uh, corn, potatoes, tomatoes, uh, those were all plants that came from, uh, from uh, the Americas. To have cumulative cultural uh, evolution, you need creative invention, reliable and faithful social transmission, High fidelity social transmission requires accurate imitative learning and sophisticated communication. No species but humans have shown these uh, capacities, and that's one of the reasons why we consider ourselves smarter uh, than any other animal. But if you look at look at the giraffe's brain, look how convoluted, look how complex their brains are. Uh, this is a kudu, which is a uh, which is an antelope. Uh, Multan is a Antelope as well. There's a goat. Not quite as complex as these. There's the bear's brain. Mandrel is a type of uh, orangutan. Baboon. If you saw uh, Ju Jumanji, the the second Jumanji movie, or the, actually it's the third, but the second Jumanji movie, mandrels were the the, uh, the uh, uh, apes with the blue faces and they had red on their face and they had white uh, as well. Those are mandrels. The larger the group of people, the better cultural information can be maintained and improved upon. You're more likely to encounter a successful model to copy from out of a larger group than out of a smaller group. There will be more innovations uh, that come from a larger group than from a smaller group. So a larger group will be more likely to have at least one person stumble on a good idea. Looking at the Polynesians settling uh, the South Pacific, the islands with the largest populations at the time of first contact, had far more different kinds of tools than the islands with the smallest populations. Bigger populations allowed for the more rapid spread of cultural innovations. However, sometimes the ratchet slips, uh, does slip and a population will lose ideas. This happened with the aboriginal population that inhabited Tasmania from the Australian mainland. This is where uh, the ab aborigines uh, originally were. Uh, they were in Australia and uh, they developed the ability to, uh, to transport themselves across water. And this is Tasmania right here. So they crossed this strait, I don't remember what the strait's called, but uh, they then they inhabited Tasmania. They lost a lot of their skills, the skills that they had exhibited, and a lot of the tools, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Uh, they lost a lot of, uh, of the tools and the skills that they had uh, when they were on Australia. When Europeans initially arrived in Tasmania, they found scattered foraging bands of humans utilizing the simplest technology. 
Archaeological digs have shown that the technology seen in their past was far more advanced than what was demonstrated in their current technology. Use it or lose it, and evidently that's what happened with them. They had all the food that they needed. Uh, they didn't need these tools anymore, for, so they lost them. Comparing the Tasmanian Aborigines with those across the Bass Strait in Australia, the Tasmanians maintained a toolkit of only 24 items, whereas the Australians maintained a toolkit of hundreds of items. All of these things they didn't need anymore, so all of these things they forgot. All of these tools. Uh, it would be the same situation uh, if, uh, if suddenly uh, we decided that uh, uh, we couldn't use electricity anymore and we had to go back to the way we used to do things, uh, how in the world could, could we get things done? Uh, we would have to, to, to create um, uh, instruments uh, that, uh, weren't, that didn't run on electricity uh, to do things. And it might be really difficult. Uh, we would have to use water power, for example, uh, to gr grind our, our grain. Uh, you know, everything, everything in, in its time, everything in its place. Uh, if we had to go back to uh, you, using horses for anything but riding, uh, you know, for, to, to work the fields and to uh, haul uh, uh, wagons and whatnot, uh, it would be difficult. We'd have to reinvent all of these things. They've all been lost. And this is what happened with the Tasmanians. Uh, when they originally came across the Bass Strait, uh, they had lots of of different instruments, but when they didn't need them in on Tasmania, they just lost them. And as it says here, the toolkit uh, in Australia had hundreds of items, and the ones on Tasmania only had 24 items. That's, the Tasmanians had lost bone tools, they had lost cold weather clothing, they had lost fish hooks, and they had lost boomerangs. Other groups uh, where the ratchet seems to have slipped include the Melanesians of the Taurus Islands north of Australia, uh, the reclusive Siriano of, of Bolivia, the reclusive Paraha of Brazil. Humans are, so it, it, it has happened with different groups, uh, gr different groups that have isolated themselves. Potentially it could happen in the United States with uh, uh, if somebody decided that they were going to go onto the top of a mountain and, and they wanted to, to uh, not use any technology, uh, and then they were able to generate uh, this idea for an extended length of time, uh, potentially you could go on up uh, to that, uh, the top of that mountain in about 100 years, and those individuals would be living very, very much differently from the people uh, that were not on the mountain. Humans are a cultural species that exists within worlds consisting of cultural information that has accumulated over history. Cultural ideas uh, greatly influence the ways that we live our lives, determining much of what we do on a daily basis. We are all born into rich cultural worlds, and we are constantly learning and being influenced by the shared ideas that make up our culture. And I mentioned this last week. Uh, when I was talking about uh, being from Indiana, uh, that is my culture, and there's no way I can get that out of my head. I, the uh, the things I learned on the uh, on 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 the farm uh, when I was growing up, all of that stuff is part of who I am, and there's no way I can get rid of it, uh, and there's no reason why I should. Um, it's the same way with uh, with uh, the Diné people, uh, the. All the traditions that you have, all the traditions that you learned in your in your home, uh, all of the taboos that you that you learned, all of that is part of your culture, and all of that, none of that can go away. It's always going to be there, uh, even if you move to Phoenix or move to Tucson or or move to New York City. It isn't. It really doesn't make any different difference. All of that will be part of who you are. And, and, of course, you'll never lose those ideas. They'll always be in the back of your head. Uh, one idea that just came up this week, uh, in my case, uh, when I was growing up, I, I baled a lot of hay. 
And uh, normally, uh, when you're young, <laughs> when you're young, you get stuck in the ugliest places. <laughs> the worst place to be uh, when you're baling hay is up in the up, up in the hay mow because it's stuffy. There's uh, there's no wind, and there's a lot of uh, hay ch hay chaff uh, that floats around in the air, and you can't get rid of it. And it gets in your nose, and you swallow it down, and you swallow it. Uh, to this day, I cannot bear to drink tea because well I can drink tea but I don't like to drink tea because to me it tastes like the hay that I swallowed you know that I was constantly breathing every summer uh, up in the hay mows. Uh it was a lot easier to work on the on the wagon it was uh, there's a lot more wind uh, the the chaff would uh, would blow away you didn't have to worry about it up in the mouth it has no place to go <laughs> And by golly, I was I was a little guy and I was young, and uh, I was up in the mouth for years. Uh, it seemed I didn't get out onto the wagon until until the later years, till I was much older, and then it was okay. Baling hay was okay, but I still can't stand tea, or I, I don't like drinking tea. I I will drink it if I have to, but uh, every time I take a sip, I remember being stuck up in the hay mow with all those hay bales coming off the elevator and whatnot. Ugh. Oh well. Anyway, that's something that just came up because uh, uh, the carpenter that's working on our roof, um, his, uh, his helper is, uh, is a farmer and uh, he can only be here when he's not, when he's not working the fields for, with, uh, for hay. Uh, and of course, then we talked about, well, we used to do this when we were kids. Uh, oh, the good old days. Our brain size is determined by the uh, encephalization uh, quotient, uh, the ratio of the brain weight of an animal to that predicted uh, for a comparable animal of the same body size. For humans, it is 4.6, or that we have a four to five times larger brain than another animal mammal our size. Only the tiny but big brain shrew has a higher ratio than humans, and they maintain a brain that accounts for 10% of their body weight. The big brain shrew. <laughs> our brains consume about 16% of our basal metabolism, even though our brains only represent 2% of our body weight. Sorry, I was getting a drink. <clears throat> The brain of the average mammal only consumes 3% of their basal metabolism. The brain of the marsupial only consumes 1% of their basal metabolism. And of course, the only marsupial we have uh, in the Americas, uh, in, the, in North America anyway, is the, the opossum. And that's what opossum looks like. That's why I put a picture of them there. It's the only marsupial we have. If you ever tangled with one, they're not, not a whole lot of fun. They won't really attack you, but they'll hiss at you. Uh, the reality is they don't see very well, so they can't really tell what you look like. Uh, they will detect you, and they'll start hissing at you. Lots of teeth. In order to maintain the massive human brain, the trade-off uh, was shrinkage, shrinkage in other areas. The chimpanzee's muscles are 27 times 27% larger than humans. Our gut, stomach, and small large intestines are 60% smaller than that of the chimpanzee. Uh, so the chimpanzee is always going to look like a, a paunchy human uh, if we compare us with them. We have a relatively flat stomach. Uh, you can maintain fat in your stomach area, of course. Uh, but as far as your intestines are concerned, they're all they're all the same size. So humans have a 60% smaller uh, gut than uh, than the chimpanzee does, and that's one of the reasons why they walk the way that they do. And this is a really big deal because when we look at uh, fossils uh, of, uh, of hominins, uh, early humans, uh, one of the things we're looking for is uh, do they walk like a chimpanzee? Uh, rocking back and forth uh, with their toes pointed out, or do they do they they walk with their toes p p uh, pointed straight uh, with with a relatively large gait? Um, and we can tell that by looking at the structure of their knees. We can look at the structure of their pelvis uh, to determine how they uh, how their locomotion was. Uh, and of course, as you can see, humans have 
have a relatively short tor torso compared to the chimpanzee and, and long legs. And of course, the other uh, apes, uh, the chimpanzee, the orangutan, and the gorilla, they have short legs and, and long torsos. One reason humans were able to reduce their digestive needs is because we were able to learn to do some of our digestion outside our bodies. We started uh, cooking our food. Cooking substantially increases the amount of energy that can be extracted from food. It denatures protein. It gelatinizes uh, starch. It makes all foods softer and easier to digest, thus requiring less energy and therefore smaller guts. We don't need the guts that uh, the chimpanzee has. One of the reasons why uh, his, uh, his gut is so large is because he needs to process food uh, that is not as easily broken down. And we as humans, of course, can. Because of cooking, humans are able to consume foods that cannot be eaten raw. Uh, this reduced the amount of chewing necessary to consume food, reducing the amount of muscle required in the human jaw. It also changed the shape of our teeth. And as you can see, we don't have a, a ripping, uh, the, the front of his mouth is for ripping meat off or ripping something off. And then these are the grinding teeth. All we have are really grinding teeth as humans because we don't need we don't need to worry about ripping off chunks of meat uh, we can we we do that in other ways by cooking it and making it softer we don't have to rip it like that the average human spends one hour chewing their food a day the average chimpanzee spends six hours chewing their food uh, by cooking our food we were able to evolve a much smaller digestive tract which freed up much energy to be used by our brains uh, a good example, uh, you can imagine uh, uh, chewing food for an extended length of time. Uh, I like to use the example of celery. Uh, if you've ever bitten into a, a uh, ripe uh, celery stalk, uh, you know, those strings, you can, you can chew on those strings for hours before you break them down enough uh, so that you can actually swallow them. Uh, but, of course, that's what chimpanzees do all the time. That's the kind of food that they're always eating. So that's why it takes six times longer for them to chew food as it does for us. And that and the fact that they can't cook their food. Many primates eat a lot of fruit. There are good reasons to eat fruit. Fruit is rich in vitamins, carbohydrates, and calories. And fruits tend to be available in concentrated patches. A good example is the apple, and I have an apple orchard right outside my door. Um, we're getting ready to, uh, I just had an apple a couple hours ago. <laughs> uh, they're just starting to ripen, and uh, boy, I'll tell you, it's, it's been a long time waiting for those apples to ripen. It's, it's, it's hard not to rip off one of those, those green ones, and there's a reason why we don't eat green apples. We have to wait for them to get a little bit more mature. And the reason is because a green apple, the seeds aren't, aren't, uh, the seeds aren't mature. So if you ate an apple that was immature, uh, then it wouldn't be able to grow another tree. You know, that's reproduction. That's the whole purpose of having fruit. That's why fruit are there, is to, uh, is to uh, plant a new, a new plant. Um, so they have, uh, uh, poisons in the, uh, in the green apples. So if you, eat, if you eat green apples and then you get a stomachache, there's a reason for that. It's because it has tannin in it. And the tannin, of course, uh, is, is irritating. So most animals will stay away from, from unripe fruit, uh, because they don't want to get sick. Now, because I grew up where I grew up, uh, we ate a lot of green apples, and of course we never got sick. But one of the things that we would do, we would eat them with salt. Uh, we used a lot of salt on our green apples, and that um, uh, broke down some of the uh, tannin in the, in the apple, so we were able to eat it. As strange and weird as that is. I think it's tannin. It may be renin. Uh, I'll have to look that up. Anyway, so when my when my apple trees are, are ripe, uh, what we'll probably do is we'll eat some of them, and we'll make the rest into cider. 
um, since we have so many. <clears throat> we have some apples that are not very good eating apples. Personally, I'm not a, uh, uh, I'm not real crazy about uh, Red Delicious, which looked like a great apple, uh, but as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't have very much flavor. And then we have uh, yellow apples uh, from a tree in, in the back of the property. And we'll probably make those into to, to cider as well. And this is what people used to do. I just read that uh, people used to drink 35 gallons of, of cider a year per person, th 35 gallons. Uh, and that's because they needed to keep it. And the only way to really keep an apple, I mean, you can keep them for a month or, or six weeks, but the best way to keep an apple is, is by uh, just drinking the juice. And that's what people used to do. They used to drink lots and lots. They used to put them in barrels and whatnot. Why am I talking about this? Because I've been thinking about apple cider. <laughs> my, my neighbor's tree, tree matured, and, and we talked him into letting us uh, press his, his apples. And we, got, we uh, made a, a gallon of uh, cider for him and a gallon of cider for us. So it was pretty good. Anyway, so we're really looking forward to our cider. Uh, to live off of a diet of fruit, you need to keep in mind where the various fruit trees are located and when they would likely be bearing ripe fruit. Perhaps the greater need for a good memory and a big brain was triggered by the need to remember fruit locations. And of course, this is when we were hunter-gatherers. Uh, humans were hunter-gatherers. Uh, you'd need to remember where the fruit is. Uh, and of course, potentially you could uh, carry those seeds around with you and plant them in different places and create new trees. Those primates that have better skills at remembering where the fruit was would have been uh, more likely to eat well and to have surviving offspring uh, than those who were stumbling about aimlessly trying to find ripe pawpaws. And you may ask yourself, well, what in the world is a pawpaw? And this is a pawpaw. That's what a pawpaw looks like. Uh, these are uh, young. Uh, they're not mature yet. Uh, they turn yellow. And the fruit is really mushy, uh, but it's really rich. Uh, we used to have these, not this plant. This is, uh, we had pawpaws in Indiana, pawpaw trees, but they didn't look like this. They didn't have these huge leaves. They were different. Uh, what's another? Uh, there's another uh, plant. I can't think of it right off the top of my head. Uh, anyway, we had pawpaw trees. And nobody would do anything with them because the fruit is uh, tastes like dates, is what a pawpaw tastes like. It's kind of a kind of slimy. A number of primate uh, species rely on food sources that require a fair bit of ingenuity to to access them. Uh, some primates' food sources include nuts and seeds encased in hard shells, tubers that need to be dug up, termites that need to be fished out of termite mounds. Strangely enough, uh, termites uh, are, taste sweet. And there's a lot of protein uh, in termites. Extractive food sources such as the ones just mentioned are often worth pursuing because they are rich in protein and energy. Tubers like potatoes or tubers, nuts and seeds, um, and this is one of the reasons uh, if you wander around uh, the United States uh, you go to, well, my home area, there were a lot of uh, uh, natives that lived there. As a matter of fact, the mound builders were there, the Adena and the Hopewell. Uh, they planted a lot of uh, nut trees, uh, so there's a lot of hickory, uh, there's a lot of uh, walnuts, um, uh, chestnuts. And now, of course, we think, oh, they're growing wild. Well, they are gr kind of growing wild, but the reality is that uh, the Native Americans who were there before uh, before the Europeans uh, moved them out. Uh, they're the ones that planted all those wonderful trees, all those wonderful nut trees. Uh, it's really kind of silly. Uh, I live in an area where everybody hates walnut trees because they, when they mow them, they shoot them out and they hate it, you know, because it messes up their lawnmowers. But the reality is, of course, you can process the, the walnuts and, and you can eat them. Uh, a lot of good food there. Uh, those primates who were able to extract nutritious foods were more likely to survive and produce viable offspring. 
Most primates live in complex social groups, maintaining clear power hierarchies, allowing them to form various relationships and alliances. Conflicts, as well as cooperation, nepotism, and reciprocity are common. And this is a actually a, a mating dance from uh, the uh, what they used to call Bushmen. I'm not exactly sure what they call them now. These are the people that live in the southern Kalahari de Desert. And, of course, these are the women egging them on. They want them to do their, their dance. Humphrey and Dunbar have hypothesized that it was the necessity to navigate through the intricate and elaborate webs of social relationships, the need to attract a mate, secure resources, and protect themselves and their offspring that led to the development of the big brain. And, of course, I don't know why I put this picture in here, but, of course, their brains aren't any bigger than these ladies' brains. Dunbar analyzed the relationship between neocortex ratio and average group size and estimated that the average size of the human ancestral population was 147.8. Looking at subsistence societies still in existence, Dunbar discovered that the average clan size was 148.4. Uh, of course, uh, the clans uh, the, uh, of the Diné people are much larger than, well, some of them are, are much larger than that. Uh, but, of course, that has, that has changed over time. So the old Scottish clans, 150 people. Uh, the, uh, if you wander down to the Kalahari, Kal Kalahari Desert, uh, you have uh, uh, groups. Of course, they, they camp in groups of... Uh, family groups of, of 15 to 25, but they are usually right about that size, 150 people. In 2011, Facebook did a survey of, of its accounts and found that the average number of, of friends that people had was between 120 and 130. The same year, Twitter analyzed their accounts and discovered that people could maintain between 100 and 200 interactions. Any groups uh, that are larger than 150 become too unwieldy uh, to manage without some institutional structure, yet smaller groups lose their advantages of large numbers, as weird as that is. So what are we seeing here? What we're seeing is the fact that you can uh, uh, interact with about 150 people. Uh, so if you think about your high school, how many people were in the high school, how many people did you interact with? You interacted with all the people in your grade. And if there were more than 150 people in the school, uh, then you, there were probably some people on the periphery that you didn't, uh, that you didn't interact with. Uh, but uh, if you think of all the people that you knew, uh, how many people, if you looked through your yearbook, how many people would you recognize? And the answer would probably be right around 150 people. Although primates are highly social mammals, in many ways, humans can be said to be an ultra-social species. Humans tend to be far more engaged with others around them than do any other primates. We are constantly attending to what others are doing. We gossip about others all the time. Our behaviors are guided a great deal by what others around us are doing. We learn by imitating others. And I, I find myself doing this... Um, uh, now that uh, I'm here, instead of uh, in Celie, uh I get to be around my wife. And what I find myself doing is trying to figure out, trying to find out what she's doing. My office is is uh, here, and hers is about uh, 15 steps uh, that way. <laughs> and I find myself, uh, even though I, I'm working on my email and I'm working with uh, uh, grading papers and I'm, I'm making lectures and. and downloading PowerPoints, uh, I, I still want to know what my wife's doing. And a lot of times, she doesn't really care. Wait a minute, she really doesn't care what I'm doing. Uh, she spends a lot of time on Facebook. Uh, she has a lot of Facebook friends. I don't know if that's good or not. Anyway, uh, we, we, we like to, uh, to make sure that we know what people are doing. Um, yeah, anyway. That's the, way, that's the way she works. In an experiment by Dean et al. in 2012, the researchers compared the ability of a chimpanzee and orangutan versus a two-and-a-half-year-old to solve a physical problem and a social problem. 
The child and the great apes performed equally well on the physical problem at about 75%. This is a chimpanzee and this is an orangutan. How in the world did I ever find, find a picture of a two and a half year old with a chimpanzee and one with an orangutan? I don't know. I don't remember looking for this one. This is kind of an old one. However, for the social problem, when the subjects had to follow the mo a model, the two and a half year olds were more likely to follow precisely what the model did. The great apes tried to solve the social problem through emulation. Most of the humans scored 100% on the social problem, while most of the apes scored 0%. Not nearly as good. So no matter how reclusive an individual or a group of humans are, culture and the biology of the human brain are bound inextricably. Humans evolve to be a cultural species. And that is that. Yep, that's that. Now this is kind of an interesting picture because these guys are natives from South America. As you can see, they're all smiling, which is kind of cool. But look at this guy. <laughs> look at the flip-flops. He's got on flip-flops and he's got on glasses. So evidently, you know, it's not like he's isolated and, and he doesn't have anything to do with the outside world uh, since he's wearing flip-flops and, and he, he's wearing glasses. These guys, you can't tell. Oh, he's got shorts on. Well, they all have shorts on. Yeah, this guy's got shorts on. Uh, anyway, yeah, so they're doing something. But we're all, we're all connected, and, 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 you know, that's not a bad thing. As humans, that's not a bad thing. If we look at our DNA, uh, if we look at our DNA, our DNA is so similar to everybody's is, is very similar, uh, all humans. Uh, so we're, we're all cut from the same cloth. Uh, if we look at chimpanzees, they're, you, can, you can look at a group of chimpanzees on one side of the mountain and a group of chimpanzees on the other side of the mountain. And if you care, compare their DNA, it is more different than, than any humans uh, in, on Earth. We're all so very, very, uh, very similar, um, which sounds like we, you know, we, that we uh, ought to pretend that all of us are exactly the same. But of course, the reality is, how are we different? Uh, we all have, I'm wearing a pair of shorts just like this guy's. Today I've got a pair of beige shorts on, cargo pants, and that's what those are. There's his pocket right there. Oh, so I guess we're brothers. Me and Patrick and this guy. <laughs> anyway, that's that's the end of the chapter. So next week we'll ta chap tackle chapter three. Uh, I'll see you guys next week.